So happy to talk to you about Skinwalker. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I I loved Eminence Hill. All I right. I love Skinwalker. You have this great knack, Robert, for capturing the old west. You clearly love stories about the old west, but you incorporate authenticity and authentic lore into your stories and your characters and you do that here the Native American aspect of this film and obviously liberally taken a lot of literary license here with Native American lore and myth in terms of skinwalkers grave robbing and mysticism but damn I felt like I was back in the Old West so well oh, done. Thank you. That's definitely what we try for, and I, I'm only able to accomplish the authenticity because I have an excellent uh, production designer, Lori Haberman, who does all my props and wardrobe, and and then you know the reenactor, uh, Wild West reenactor community here in Arizona is, uh, you know, we couldn't do it without them, and then of course our Native American uh, actor who brings so much realism to it, um, Victorio Pope, who uh, played uh, one of the the two, he's the one who's uh, I think his name is uh, um, Storm Talker or mm -hmm. something in the credits, but, you know, we never say his name, but he's the, uh, he's the one who has the confrontation or the conversation with uh, the young deputy played by Cameron Kokeki, and uh, he actually speaks fluent Apache. He's from the uh, White Mountains, and he trained uh, our actor Daniel Link, who played Willard, to speak Apache. He also trained some of our other Native actors who were not Apache uh, the language, so... I mean, it's just so cool to use authentic Apache in a movie. You know, on this budget level, usually you don't see that type of realism. So I really owe that to Victoria. I owe that to Lori. And, you know, without that, and to the, the reenactors in general, because they really just, they, they, they make it work with, uh, you know, really small film, getting a better uh, production, way of, punching way above our pay grade. I owe it to them. <laughs> That stood out for me that you have Native Americans working in the film, playing Native Americans, because from personal experience, so many of my friends, we're going back 40 years, but these were guys that had done all the westerns with John Ford, sure. you know, worked with John Wayne, and quite a few of them were always tapped to be put into red face makeup to play Native Americans. I know, I know. So... For me, for me to come full circle to knowing the guys who did that and now to yeah. see filmmakers actually, like yourself, casting Native Americans oh, in a film, I just think it, it's wonderful and it adds oh, so much more. Oh, I, I completely agree. And I would never, you know, cast uh, someone who wasn't Native American to play one. It simply doesn't. Not only is it disrespectful, but it, it really doesn't work for the film. I mean, Native yeah. Americans have a specific look, and um, I think it's a little bit of cultural appropriation when you kind of have other people <laughs> are giving them a fair representation, uh, and a fair representation of their culture. So it's like, it's such a beautiful culture, it's such a beautiful part of American history, and it's like, you know, it just doesn't work, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, back in the day, they'd have a white guy playing in India. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's... So it's just not, you know, it's not cool. But uh, I, I'm very lucky. Again, I, I have Jeff Yazzie and Eddie Rodriguez play the other two uh, Native characters in the film. And they, they all had excellent uh, looks. They were culturally... They had they knew things about their culture that people outside of it aren't going to know. Right. You know, you're, you're unless you're like a, a, a professor of Native American studies or something, you're not going to know... I mean, like the Apache language, for instance, it's, 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 you know, it's not English or Spanish or French. It's, it's, it's far more, uh, you know, limited in use than that. So there's just so many, like, things that Victoria particularly was able to help with, uh, really being a technical advisor as well. Mm -hmm. And he told me, like, he said everybody was good, but he said that Daniel Link was excellent. Like, he, when he spoke Apache in the movie as Willard, he mm -hmm. said you would have thought he was speaking like he knew our language. Oh, wow. Every year. Because he really worked hard. And, like, I mean, a, a, you know, I, that, that's just, again, a kudos to Daniel, too, for being that dedicated of a student. And, you know, for Victoria, for being that dedicated of a, of a teacher. Because, 
I love those scenes, and I insisted on doing them in Apache because of the uh, the beauty of the language and just bringing the audience into the realism of like, you know, I hate when they do those like, you say what, white man, you know, like yeah. that kind of like it just <laughs> takes me out of it. You know, it's like ah, I want to hear the real, the, the the authentic language in it. Use the subtitles, and I don't think it distracts because I think it's just, you know, it just adds to the experience. Yeah, the subtitles don't don't subtitles don't distract. And for me, the mark uh, anytime you have film that may require subtitles, to me, the mark of a good storyteller is when you really don't need the subtitles because the performances exactly. are telling us, showing us what we need to know. And I don't care what oh, the yeah. language you can tell by the by the tonal inflection. Um, if somebody is enraged or happy or sad, so you don't necessarily need the specific words if the story is no, being told right. You're right. You're, you're right. You really don't. I mean, no Gibson's films are good examples of that. Uh, Apocalypto in particular yes. is very easy to follow without reading the subtitles because, yes, you're right. The inflection really, uh, you know, again, that, 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 that was a little bit of inspiration for this too because Mel had used the language there that was. Uh, not Apache, it was something like uh, a language, I don't know, even though it's still anything like, it's kind of like you with passion, which is a language is hardly in existence, you know, it's kind of a it's very obscure, mm -hmm. I mean, very early colonial period native language, which I think was Mayan or something, so that's that's super cool, and language is a language is really a neat thing to uh, to play with in a film, I mean even in the fantasy world, like Lord of the Rings when uh people would speak in Elvish or things like that. When you knew when it sounded real and people had done their work, or if it's just like some bad sci-fi movie where they're like, clock, 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 like alien talk, like yeah. with clicks of clocks. It's like, well, that, does, you know, that doesn't sound like a language. So, <laughs> yeah, language is really important. You know, I'm a big J.R. Tolkien fan. He, he invented Dwarvish and Elvish and Orcish. Mm -hmm. He had alphabets for all this stuff. I mean, you talk about world building, so... You know, it's always fun when we can implore different methods to tell our story and, and things that the audience is overly familiar with and, and try not to live on on old tropey cliches so much because mm -hmm. they won't entertain because we've seen them a thousand times. That's right. So, you know, nothing will, enter <laughs> nothing will entertain us a, a thousand times after we've seen it. So, Where did the idea for this particular story arise? And could, because you could have taken, you know, the core idea of the of grave robbing a Native American grave or and stealing something, and you know, obviously spirits can be bad spirits, evil spirits are evoked from that. But you could have taken this in so many directions with that core idea. So I'm curious, what sparked the idea for this story for you, and and led you to flesh it out the way you did through character. Well, basically what happened was, you know, we were all in lockdown, the COVID, like the COVID lockdown. Uh, you know, nobody was working. <laughs> and that's what kind of inspired the story was like, well, you know, we can sit here and not do anything or we can go on a location that's remote. And if we all get up there and we don't get sick and, you know, nobody kind of live on a mountain for a month, uh, we'll be okay to make a movie. And, and, and that was really what was in my, my thought process was making something that was topical about an invisible enemy that you don't know if the person next to you has it. And that's where I kind of, in my, you know, as you say, I take a, a fair amount of license with the Skinwalker myth, which is more of a shape shifter. But I said, well, you know, what if it was something like John Carpenter's The Thing, where it could spread from human to human uh, and inhabit one body, and then when that body is essentially destroyed or whatever, it'll find a new host. And it was the, uh, you know, basically it's a pandemic movie in that respect. Because mm -hmm. uh, obviously COVID was heavily on my mind as it was on the mind of pretty much the whole planet last year. And um, I, 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 it was, uh, you know, I thought back on like the thing, it was like, well, what was so frightening was that the monster is not physical in the sense that like you can see it, it's got big fangs and all that. It's, it's your best friend, it's your wife, it's your husband, it's your, you know, that to me is a, really a terrifying premise. Right. Um, you know, and then the people can feel when they're, when they're you know, being changed. Uh, but that might be too late for the person next to them, you know, or, 
uh, so it's interesting. I, I, I basically just leaned into that. What I was feeling at the time was a lot of anxiety, and you know, we all were. Um, and, and basically, I just asked the cast and crew who were like, we did a very, very you know, modest budget and very few people involved in the production. I mean, from, even from an independent film perspective, this was a very, very small group of filmmakers and actors because of the, uh, because of the pandemic, you know, and then we had to be really careful. But um, it, it, that, that's really what made me go that route and, and kind of take the Skinwalker myth as far as going from a shapeshifter to more like something that travels from person to person, which I just think really worked really well. And, it's, you know, it, it essentially they become, you know, very aggressive, almost <laughs> like aggressive zombie-like. But, you know what I mean? They're possessed, yep. really. Possessed is a better thing to say. Than the, you know, they become possessed. And when the spirit overtakes them and overpowers them, they're, you know... They're goners. Freaks, freaks havoc. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, I, I just basically yeah, it's a kind of a pandemic slash you know, uh, and then I, I, I like setting things in like uh, if I do a horror film, I always try you know particularly after having done some that were contemporary, I try to set them in a world where the horror film is uh, the characters are interesting. So if mm-hmm. we took out the horror movie aspect of it, the scares, the supernatural, the whatever, we'd still want to see a movie or a story about the characters. This and, this would have worked. If you had removed the horror element and you just had grave robbing and Native American and then having a, a standoff like that, you know, the characters are, it, the film would have stood on its own. It truly yeah, I, would I have. Thank you. And that's always what I try to do because, I mean, again, you know, I try to make my characters when I write them people that I'd want to see a movie about, regardless of genre. You know, like, what are they, what is their life story? You know, if, if they're just, you know, Jane and John Smith, well, that's not, you know, they're, he's a dentist and she's an attorney. Well, you know, that's not worth telling. You know what I mean? Yep. Let's make them outlaws on the run and let's make them, you know, something exciting. Um, and that's kind of uh, been my approach to I think it injects a fair, a good amount of uh, people start to, you know, because they're interested in the characters, the characters have an interesting backstory, then we're going to be more uh, attached to them. Mm-hmm. It's going to matter more when the, you know, the quote, the monster, the adversary, the horror chaos agent inevitably killed most of them. You know, mm-hmm. it's going to make it more impactful storytelling. So um, that's just kind of my rule with horror films. Make make a movie that if it wasn't a horror film, we could still watch it. Well, and, and that really stands out, not just while Marshall Bascom and, and Deputy Riggs and, and Maisie, that they're all on the trail, and you see the personality conflicts. It really stands out when Vern, when everybody shows up at the cabin, and you've got yeah. Nellie there, and you insert this great moral compass moral commentary through Vern's character mm-hmm. when they find out that these three women are all married to Willard. They're all sister wives. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, Charlie Motley, I think he's fabulous. He, he, he is, he's, he's excellent. He, was, he was excellent in Eminence Hill as well. And to, yeah. But to see him here, it's like he stepped out of the 1800s. And oh, just yeah. the inflection... That morality, yeah, we're outlaws, yeah. but we draw the line, and that really yeah, comes we don't have out. Child pride. Yeah, that. and his whole thing about never disrespecting women, never laying a hand on a woman, that really yeah. speaks volumes as to the depth of the character. Yeah, we oh, may be. I mean, I, yeah, I try to make the outlaws human beings and the people that do have moral codes. You know, it's like, particularly if, you know, in a, the time period, there was a very fine line between lawmen and outlaws. Yep. You know, and, and often people could become an outlaw for plenty of what we could consider just several reasons. The crooked bank took your farm, you know, and you were out, and you didn't have any options. And, you know, you wanted to strike back at the system that had wronged you, and that's kind of the James, the Jesse James uh, uh, mythology. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I try to make the outlaws human beings. Yeah, they have standards. They're not abusing women. They're not murdering innocent people that they're like you know it's, uh, they don't have to be uh, you know villains with you know little beard devil beards you know, right. no, uh, that's not interesting anyway 
you know, and it's interesting to see the duality. And we saw the law enforcement guys, traditionally our good guys, can kind of show some darker side, and that's okay too. Yeah, you know, that, that creates more interest. If, you, if, the, if the white hat and the black hat, well, there's you know, it's not so. Uh, we got a lot of gray hats. You got a lot of gray hats yeah, in Skinwalker. It's more real. People are complicated. Yeah, you know, and people are are multifaceted. I mean, it's, I, I doubt there's very many people. Uh, there's certainly some, but there's not a huge amount of people that are, oh, that person's evil, or oh, that person is good. There, there's there's traits that vary from person to person, and so much of what we do is is, uh, is, tr- is uh, you know uh, environmentally influenced. You know, the choices that we make uh, are, are impacted by the society that we live in, the options or the lack thereof that a society would give us. Uh, you know, again, going back to the James brothers, you know, people that were kind of railroaded by the railroad. You mm-hmm. know, it's like there's a there's a reason why they robbed banks and robbed the railroad. It wasn't uh, not to say they made the unethical choice. They didn't, but you could see how still people who aren't complete monsters could still make choices that are that are the wrong choice. But mm-hmm. we can at least relate to it. They're not like child murderers or, or, or people that abuse women. So there's like, you know, um, they still have standards. I think some of the organized crime films or, or show like the Soprano show, there was, there was levels of depravity within even in organized crime. Like many of them wouldn't do what other ones would do. You know, there was layers to it. So, um, and you give us, I, we also see that a little bit of hypocrisy on, on their part too, because here you are, you've robbed an Indian grave and stolen something, but here you are worried about burying the dead. Right. But it's that, re- you know, you've got reverence on the one hand and then disrespect on the other. And I just found that really fun, how you played no, with that. And I, I, I try to also, if you're doing anything historical, I don't ever want to be preachy, but I do think it's important to be historically accurate, not to whitewash yep. history, not to put things in the context that simply didn't make sense because in my mind you're not doing a service to anyone uh you're not being faithful to it. it's a little bit disrespectful to the people that lived in that time where there was a lot of discrimination against natives and there was robbing of their graves and they would sell their bones as trinkets you know and, and things like that i mean this actually happened yep so it's like to make it like that wasn't a thing or that, you know, the army didn't do a lot of terrible things. You know, to whitewash that doesn't serve anyone any 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 purpose. And again, I think, you know, without being like, you know, uh, appearing as there's a political or, a, you know, a, move, a motivation. No, I mean, the motivation is to entertain. But with that said, you can still be respectful and not, not gloss over the ugly parts of our past, because there's much beauty in our past, but just mm-hmm. as we're talking about the gray hat, there's, mm-hmm. there's things in our past that are wrong, too, and that's okay to acknowledge that. That's not, the, you know, that, that's, a, that, that's, that's what we all should do, own our mistakes or, you know, the mistakes of our forebears. So I think, um, I think that there's been a real push recently in a lot of film and television to uh, present an image of history that was unauthentic in an effort to feel more inclusive. Mm-hmm. But that actually really doesn't, if it's not true, it, that doesn't work. Right. You know, like, if you make it all inclusive and everybody's equal, but it's in the 1800s, you're like, you're right, but what is that saying to the people? Like, well, start with women, for instance, who didn't even have the right to vote until the 19, but, you know, like, it's not, you're not being honest. You're, you're showing a fictitious version of the past that, that doesn't, acknowledge the injustices and I you know so that's this way I think when people try to go ultra woke they end up whitewashing yeah I know that's not the intention but that's what they do that's you know uh, you know I'm sure that you know Susan B Anthony wouldn't be too keen on that you know or you know so I think it's just important to keep that in perspective even when it's a you know it's not a political film it's not a a, a preachy film you know um Still, still be cognizant of the environment of the of the time period that you're depicting. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got you're wearing so many hats here: writer, director, producer, cinematographer, and editor. I have yeah. to say, your visuals are beautiful. I love your oh, well, color thanks. your color palette. The saturation that you have heightens everything. And then your location, surrounded by trees, up on a mountain. You have a couple little clearings here and there. 
But the overall visual tonal bandwidth is just beautiful, Robert. You ju- oh, you. you judiciously use extreme close-ups just to punctuate for effect. I love what you do to heighten the color of blood, making it almost a, a red blackish brown. I'm trying to make it pop. It's a hard yeah. color to film, you know. It's, it's a hard color to video. The digital sensors don't like it too much, so we, we do try. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very difficult. But I'm curious, did you shot list, did you storyboard this? Because this is a very visual film, and in many instances, yeah. it's very graphic. But then those sh- your shot choices... You you stick primarily with a lot of two shots, mid twos, twos. You have some close ups, but as I said, the ECUs you really keep to a minimum, and only when you really need to pack a punch. And it's all just yeah. it's packaged so beautifully and appropriately for this oh, story. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I rarely do have the opportunity to board out a shot. I mean. My shot lists are relatively, like, I approach every scene uh, based on what, what I feel the scene calls for. Uh, I, I usually, like, particularly, you know, lately when the films have been, been getting smaller and I've been having to keep in myself, which I thoroughly enjoy, by the way, I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't have the time, you know. I mean, I'm producer, too, so it's like I've got a million things going on, and it's literally like... I wish that wasn't the case. Like, if I was just the cinematographer, I probably would board out everything, and I'd probably have a 20-page a shot list for every scene. But, you know, that, that's not, that's just not, uh, I, I'm doing, you know, I do my own casting, too, and stuff. So it's like, I just don't have the uh, the time in the day. So essentially with the shots, I usually feel like if there's a big action sequence, or there's something we really have to get right, or we're doing a lot of effects work, or... Uh, you know, going to be implementing it with uh, CGI, then obviously you have to board it and you have to do those things. But ordinarily, when I'm writing a script, I kind of already have in my head uh, a, a, a shot list of sorts because I write the scenes and I know what gear, if I'm going to put it on a crane or if I'm going to put it on a dolly or if I'm going to put it on a, on, a, on a gimbal, you know, it's all kind of like there already. I think it would probably be a lot more important. It would definitely be a lot more important had I not been the writer, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, to really be like, okay, how am I doing this? But as I write the scenes, I do. I'm already making my gear list in my head. So um, that said, though, it's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to shoot it on paper first. Uh, I agree. It's great to pour it out as much as possible. I also agree with that. Uh, But it's like one of those things in independent film where what's great and what's right, the right way to do it, sometimes you got to cut corners uh, because you you got to sleep a couple hours and you got to, you know. Um, so, yeah, you just got to gotta roll with it. <laughs> now, I'm curious because you and, and your brother Owen, both of you were editing. And because you were shooting, directing, lensing, and editing, were you looking and doing any kind of preliminary editing at the end of a day? Did you wait until you had all the footage? Or were you kind of doing editing in your head as you were shooting? Because even though oh, you I'm wrote... Not, yeah, I, I, that's the good thing about, you know, having a decent amount of experience directing films is that you know when you can move on and you know when you can't. And then you know when you have, like, you know levels of it. Like, do I have the scene? Yes, I have the scene. Do I have another hour to make it a better scene, or don't I? You know, like you're always editing in your head. You know, while you're shooting it, you always are thinking about how it's going to cut. And often there's a lot of variables. You know, there's not again going back to the independent film workflow. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually, we're bringing you know, not not all the actors are uh, are physically in the same state, city, or what have you. Uh, we try to do, you know, Zoom type uh, rehearsals and stuff. But we don't have that type of interaction often, um, particularly if you have like a name actor or something. You don't see them. You have like a meeting with them. You'll have a little bit of character work done, but you don't have much time until you get there, right? Uh, to work to work things out. So it's like scenes tend to have like a certain rhythm to them, where there'll be like dialogue you've written that you thought was going to land a lot better. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't. It could be the writing's not good or, or the actor's struggling with it or both. Or, so you have to, like, scenes have to evolve when you're shooting them a lot, uh, particularly on an independent level. So, like, if you're married to, like, it has to be this way, 
that's that's not going to work. Yeah. You have to be like, okay, what's working? And like, if it's a problem scene, it doesn't happen all the time. But you'll shoot a scene and you'll say, geez, I just know this is not. It read a lot better. This is just not working. So you have to think very quickly about how can you salvage the scene. You know, and and there's always options. Like you you look at it, you say, okay, I got three actors here. I got this. I got that. What's not working the way I thought it would? And that's where we'll be like take a little break, think about it, and the answer will come to you. You know, it's like, all right, this is how we're going to fix this. You're going to do this, you're going to do that. You know, you salvage the uh, salvage the scene. If you're, if you're just going by a shot list, you're not going to be able to, you know, the shot list can't tell you, can't predict the future, um, you know. And, uh, and so that, that's, uh, as far as editing goes, I, yeah, I already have my cuts in my head. Uh, the editing process, uh, Owen does, like, the first pass on it. Mm-hmm. And then I come behind and I do my pass, which is like, you know, it's just, it's, it's pretty thorough. And yeah, he edits on set. He edits, uh, you know, it's, it's great when you can show dailies because, you know, these movies are, they're tough to make for the crew and they're tough to make for the cast. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, it's like, they have to put a lot of energy into it. And if you were to come across our movie set, you might very well think you're just, we're just like a, uh, you know, a family, like our equipment's pretty small. It's not, you know, we don't have a lot of bells and whistles. We don't shoot on area Lexus. We shoot on little mirrorless cameras now. And, uh, you, you know, that you want people to know that all their work is going into something that's actually worth it. So dailies are important for that reason, you know, even more so because I kind of already know, like, not, not, but I do. I do know when I have the scene. Mm-hmm. I don't really need the dailies as much. I, I do use it for the cast and the crew, though, to motivate them and say, look, you guys, like, I know it's hard, but look what we're getting. Mm-hmm. And that, that keeps people uh, enthusiastic about, you know, they know they're not wasting their time. You know, I would be remiss to not ask you about the incredible, incredible third act where we actually get to see a malevolent spirit. Was yeah. that... Was that makeup and costume? Was that CGI? Because that... And then you take everything into slow motion for this very powerful scene. I got to tell you, absolute stunner, but our, our, that spirit is just scary as hell. It reminded me of the Australian film, The Babadook. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, what, was that practical or was that CGI? Because it is stunning. Yeah, it's about 95% practical. Mike Aguirre um, built uh, most of the creature suit. Uh, Kelly Jo Richardson played the Skinwalker woman, and basically she's like, they did a body paint on her. Uh, she's practically naked. I mean, you can't see that, obviously, but it's like she got body painted from head to toe, basically. Uh, and then they built um, it's a, a very elaborate uh, headdress for her. She's wearing a wig under that because she's actually a blonde-haired like blue-eyed woman, <laughs> uh, and young, so like she looks nothing like that creature. So yeah, they did a great job, and and uh, Victoria Sandoval is our key makeup and effects artist on that too. So it was a good team. Uh, they came out and they spent all day with uh, with Kelly. Like they had to paint her from literally from head to toe, like almost every inch of her body, and uh, then like the jewelry, the, the the very skimpy type of outfit. They we weren't going for like. You know, uh, uh, we're trying. We're trying to make it like a sexy thing, obviously. But you just you, we wanted it to look like a, you know, like this black kind of old, decrepit kind of thing, but also very powerful, like you know, the long fingernails and all that. And so it's basically body paint, uh, uh, a headdress, a wig, and um, and then you know, yeah. I mean, it's it's a little bit of in post to kind of take away some of the facial features and make sure. it look more spirit, spirit mm-hmm. human, you know, kind of like very dark and, and sinister, really kind of using like the head of the headdress, the top of the headdress where the animal skull is, as are, uh, almost like those are her eyes. Kind yeah, of that's way. your so focal I point. Because really well, they did actually add eyes at one point that were like in the CGI, ad, and they didn't, it wasn't nearly as scary. It was kind of mm-hmm. that void. It was far more frightening to me. Oh, I really love what they did with her hands and how I, the wind effects were just a, poor Amelia Haver and I blew, shot her with a leaf blower. Oh, and God. And we got the wind to just go insane, you know, and like, 
uh, shooting it in high frame rate. I think we shot that at like 200 and something frames a second. So it's really got, and with that really powerful, like the leaf blower is a mess, but it really just blasts the air at you. Yeah. That everybody's hair and the dust and everything just gives it that real supernatural uh, element to it. Yeah, and it's then, that know, frozen in time. Color shift from day to, to night to back to day. I mean, I, it came out really well. And it's one of those things when you're shooting it, you're not sure if it's going to work because it's like, okay, this is kind of crazy. We're doing a leaf blower and we're, you know, whatever. But it, it, I, I was really happy with it. And again, great, great team behind us. So. Uh, uh, that, is, that sequence is an absolute stunner. I mean, oh, I I was my mouth was agape, and I was just staring at it. I actually rewound and rewatched that scene a couple times because it is so good, so oh, well done, you. and I love anything that has the potential to really make me jump out of my chair. But I was so spellbound um, by what I was seeing that the that whole thing of the wind, everything slow motion, and you really went slower than slow motion typically is. Oh, yeah. I mean, usually, like, 90-some or 120 frames is about as slow as you want to go. Yeah. I bumped it to, I think it was 240 frames a second. So it was like, I really wanted to give it, like, a dream slash other world. Yeah. Other world. It has some place between heaven and hell, the spirit world, like, invading our world. And I so I felt like just really over-cranking it as high as the camera possibly would go was the way to go. And, um... Uh, well, that was the. That, I love it because you get you get more. It's just it's just you know yeah we are kind of like action sequences. We go we do slow motion a lot. Mm -hmm. This I wanted to really get more more blur, more more yeah kind of. Uh, I don't know if you remember this movie Star Trek the um, the motion picture, not the best Star Trek film. The first history, one, yeah. The scene when they're when they're caught in that weird vortex mm -hmm. and they're like everything is in like redonkulous slow motion, but the audio is all distorted, and that's. Kind of the way I approached that scene, it was kind of an influence for it. I'm a big Trekkie, so that was like, I always have those classic sci-fi or horror films in my head when I'm looking for to draw inspiration on how to shoot a scene, and I'm like, how did they do that? That was super cool. Well, you know, the, the trails, like the the, the the trail, the motion trails after when somebody moves, and all that stuff just adds to that. Yeah, you no. Know, we know we're seeing something that's not natural. Yeah, and that definitely comes across, and that is, I mean. It is. It's an incredible scene. But as I said, I, I really, I love this film, Robert. It is just, oh, it's so, so well done. I love the story. I love the three dimension of your characters, the stories driving them and how everything intersects. It all makes perfect sense. Nothing is coming out of left field and you sit there scratching your head. I, this really, I love it. I really love it, oh, Robert. Hi. Yeah, it was, it was a fun film to make in a dark time, you know, unfortunately for, for everybody with the horrible COVID pandemic, but it was like, that was just the way I approached the casting crew. I'm like, do you guys want to watch Tiger King again, or do you want to like, <laughs> make a movie? You know, that's kind of it, because, you know, nobody was working, nobody was doing anything. And the movie saved me mentally, you know. No, oh, I'm sure. Beyond stir-crazy, uh, not, not, you know, not being able to get out of my house and, you know, whatever. So I, I, I just jumped into a project and others but you know they agreed with me they wanted to get out and work and just make something yeah oh robert this has been such a joy i can't thank you enough i hope oh, thank you so much i i can't wait to see your next project next films and i hope i get to talk to you again definitely definitely yeah the next one we're doing is hellhounds it's about uh, <laughs> werewolves who are bikers biker werewolves Okay, well, that's okay, a new a one. Fun with it. Yeah, again, the, the horror movie, but I have to have the characters interesting. So, outlaw bikers are, you know, kind of the modern equivalent of the outlaw from the Wild West. That's it. You know, and that's where they just work for me because they're interesting. You know, they're they they're not, you know, regular John and Jane Smiths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I can't wait for that, Robert. Thank you so so much. Well, thank you. And I'll talk to you again soon, I hope. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.